Good evening. I'm Steve Beebe, first vice president of NCA. Welcome to the 2012 Carol C. Arnold Distinguished Lecture, tonight presented by Marshall Scott Poole. This evening's lecture is sponsored by Pearson Higher Education. As publishers committed to the discipline of communication, Pearson Higher Education has a long history of working with NCA. They further research, disseminate vital information, and encourage participation in the field of communication. We thank them for their continued support and partnership. In 1994, the Administrative Committee of NCA established our lecture this evening, the Carol C. Arnold Distinguished Lecture. The Arnold Lecture is given in a plenary session each year at our annual convention and features the most accomplished researchers in the field. The topic of the lecture changes annually so as to capture the wide range of research being conducted in the field and to demonstrate the relevance of work at large. The lecture has been named for Carol C. Arnold, Professor Emeritus of Pennsylvania State University, trained under A. Craig Baird at the University of Iowa. Arnold was the co-author with John Wilson of Public Speaking as a Liberal Art, author of Criticism of Oral Rhetoric and co-editor of the Handbook of Rhetorical and Communication Theory. Although primarily trained as a humanist, Arnold was nonetheless one of the most active participants in the New Orleans Conference of 1968, which helped put social scientific research and communication on solid footing. Thereafter, Arnold edited communication monographs because he was fascinated by empirical questions. As one of the three founders of the journal Philosophy and Rhetoric, Arnold also helped move the field toward increased dialogue with the humanities in general. For these reasons and for many more reasons, Arnold was dubbed the teacher of the field when he retired from Penn State in 1977. Dr. Arnold died in January of 1997. So to present the Carol C. Arnold Lecture is among the highest honors bestowed by NCA. It was my great pleasure and is my great privilege to select this speaker. This evening's speaker, one of our most distinguished scholars in the discipline, Dr. Marshall Scott Poole. Let me tell you something about him. I know you have some information that's been given to you, but let me embellish on that a bit. Dr. Poole is professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. He's also senior research scientist at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, director of the Institute for Computing in the Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He's also co-director of the Advanced Research and Technology Collaboratory of the Americas, a joint project of the Organization of American States and the University of Illinois. Scott received his BA degree in Communication Arts from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His MA degree in communication is from Michigan State University, and he received his PhD in 1980 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where, uh, where he also minored in management. His research interests include group and organizational communication, information systems, collaboration technologies, organizational innovation, and theory construction. He's the author of over 150 articles, book chapters and published proceedings and has co-authored or edited 11 books. Now when I asked Scott for some information about him, that's what he gave me. And I've gleaned something, but after, with additional research, I think there's more to say about our speaker this evening. Let me tell you more about his distinguished accomplishments. In addition to being at the University of Illinois, he's held faculty positions or visiting faculty positions at the University of Michigan, the University of Minnesota, Texas A&M University College Station, and this year he's a visiting professor at Wierdge University, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. He's received many awards and accolades for his work. Let me mention just a few of them this evening. He received the Dissertation of the Year Award in 1980. By my count, he's received 18 top paper awards at regional, national, and international conferences. He's also received the Golden Anniversary Monograph Award from NCA, the Best Article in Management, Academy of Management Review, the Ernest Borman Award from the Group Communication Division. He received that award twice, once for the Handbook of Group Communication Theory and Research, and also for Theories of Small Groups, Interdisciplinary Perspectives. He received that award in 2006. 
He also received the Dennis Gowron Best Article Award from the Group Communication Division of NCA, the B. Aubrey Fisher Award for the Best Article in the Western Journal of Communication, and the Best Book Award from the Organizational Communication Division of NCA. His articles have appeared in Communication Monographs, Human Communication Research, the Quarterly Journal of Speech, Communication Research, Small Group Research, Management Science, Organization Science, Information Systems Research, MIS Quarterly, and the Academy of Management Review, among others. He's also Senior Editor of Foundations of Communication Theory Series for Blackwell Publishers. He has served on 17 journal editorial boards and an additional 18 journals. By my count, that's uh, editorial assistance for 35 journals and has three times been a guest associate editor of three communication journals. Because of his outstanding scholarship, he's been named a fellow of the International Communication Association. He's re he received the Stephen A. Chafee Career Productivity Award from ICA, and he's a distinguished scholar of the National Communication Association. He's also a member of Phi Kappa Phi and Phi Beta Kappa. Over the past four years, the Institute for Computing in Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences that he directs has garnered funded projects worth over $5 million. He's been a leader in developing NCA website to identify external funded grants as well as develop a new video series to encourage external research funding of communication research. In addition to being an outstanding scholar, our speaker this evening is an outstanding educator. He's received teaching recognition listed as excellence by student at the University of Illinois for more than 16 semesters. Texas A&M, he received the Association of Former Students College of Liberal Arts Teaching Award. And Scott, I think this is my favorite one, the uh, Fish Camp namesake, Camp Pool, at the 2004 Texas A&M Fish Camp. I'm, that's an outstanding. In addition to his distinguished scholarship, education credentials, he's also been a leader in this organization, NCA. He served as chair of the Organizational Communication Division, chair of the Research Board, member of NCA's Executive Committee, founding chair of the Group Communication Division. It was my great privilege to select Scott for this position. I can frankly think of no one else who deserves this recognition more than our speaker this evening. Dr. Poole's address paradoxes of collaboration. Please join me in a warm congratulatory welcome for a distinguished scholar, educator, leader, and friend, Marshall Scott Poole. It's truly an honor to be asked to give the Carol Arnold Distinguished Lecture for 2012. Um, I never had the privilege of being taught by Professor Arnold, but I was taught by one of his students at the University of Wisconsin, and, and uh, I remember him transmitting many of Carol Arnold's uh, uh, ideals to me. And, in a real sense, I see why Carol Arnold was one of the teachers of the field. I also want to thank Steve Beebe, both for selecting me for the lecture, but also for his contributions to our understanding of collaboration in our field. Through the many editions of his small group book, I've learned an immense amount. And I've also learned an immense amount from working with Steve, because he truly embodies collaboration in the best sense of the term. I also want to extend a thank you to Pearson for sponsoring this lecture. Today my topic is paradoxes of collaboration. And I chose collaboration partly because it's something I've researched for a number of years, but also partly because it's something that's central to the idea of community around which this conference is organized. I've paired it with the notion of, con of paradox, which has been a central interest of many in our field, because I, 
uh, collaboration itself can be problematic. It's both easy and difficult. It can be both cooperative and uh, in many cases lead to very negative outcomes. And as a result, I think paradox is a good way to look at this. Let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I first learned about collaboration really working at the Center for Conflict Resolution when I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin. A number of other good scholars in our field I was fortunate to work with there. Um, I am a group and organizational communication scholar and my teacher Dean Hughes is someone I learned a lot about collaboration from. I've been extremely fortunate to collaborate with a number of other great scholars over the years and in part of those collaborations to study group support systems and collaboration technologies. As Steve mentioned I direct an institute which focuses mainly on collaboration and I I really want to thank in many ways my many colleagues in this field. The address I'm going to give today and the analysis I'm going to present is in the realest sense a collaboration because I'm drawing on so much good research that has been developed by people in our field and um, there's a lot of it as you will see. I also want to thank Western Illinois University because they had me there for the Wayne N. Thompson lecture and that's where I really first talked about this notion and developed some of the ideas that I've extended today in this lecture. What I'm going to do first is talk about what collaboration is. Then I'm going to shift and talk about some of the challenges and paradoxes involved in collaboration and then turn to how we deal with these. In particular, communication scholarship that suggests ways in which we can move forward in taking advantage of the paradoxes of collaboration. And then finally, I'll close with the suggestion of a few future directions. Collaboration is a multifaceted concept. These are some of the many terms that are associated see these in most all journals. When I first gave my lecture at, the Wayne Tom at Western Illinois, collaboration wasn't a very fashionable topic. But now it's become very fashionable and there are both positive and negative connotations to collaboration. As I was growing up, to be called a quizzling was an awful thing. And in fact, I resisted the use of the word collaboration in my own work for years because of that association. In many ways, if you search for collaboration, uh, for example, you go to Google, in many ways, it's really been co-opted by the corporate world. As my colleague Stan Dietz would say, there's been a corporate colonization of collaboration. If you search on Google, you'll turn up several million associations, and the most common ones are companies that promise to solve the problem for you. Now, in many cases, what they're advocating doesn't look like the kind of collaboration I study. But, uh, but uh, and in many ways, what I would like to do is to refocus and emphasize the wonderful research that's been done in our field on collaboration as a way of taking this area back. Collaboration plays a critical role in communication scholarship, and we have a lot to tell the world about collaboration. It's a fundamental concern of our discipline. From the days in which Aristotle talked about the polis down to the present with all of the emphasis on collaboration through scholars like Kenneth Burke, our field has been heavily focused on collaboration, though they may not have called it that. Our field is also has a practice and process orientation. And as you'll see today, the best way to understand collaboration is to look at the process by which it unfolds. Not many of the people that deal with collaboration in other dis disciplines bring this sort of orientation. And in addition, our field is very concerned with the ethics of collaboration. Democracy, as Bill Keith's wonderful book showed, is deeply imbued within the whole tradition of public speaking and small group research. And we, I think, are in a unique position to advance uh, philosophy and uh, ethics and an understanding of collaboration for many fields. Now, let's start with the provisional definition of collaboration. I'm going to call collaboration, and I'm drawing here on the authors listed below. You'll see here, I really do believe this is a collaborative presentation. I'm drawing on great people thinking really well on these things. That collaboration is activity of two or more people that's directed by a joint purpose and or with regard and respect for the individual goals, because not all collaborations involve something joint. Sometimes the individuals are taking things away with them. 
It honors the perspectives and collaboration and contributions of all the parties in some ways. And it strives for a high quality experience and outcome. That's a very high bar to set, to tell you the truth, but that's what we tend to think about when we think about collaboration. Now, collaboration itself is an interesting and problematic term, and I think maybe the best way to explore some of its implications are to look at some examples. And the first example I want to bring out is T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. As you know, T.S. Eliot's Wasteland was one of the poets that established him as the poem, poet of the 20th century. But it only came about after intensive interaction over a very long period of time with Ezra Pound, who edited the poem to death, pretty much. Now the question is, is the, is the Wasteland then T.S. Eliot's poem? Or is it Ezra Pound's and T.S. Eliot's? Or is it Ezra Pound's? Was Ezra Pound a junior collaborator, or was he the senior esthete that reshaped that poem? Very many times, it's hard to determine the boundaries of a collaboration and exactly who is responsible for what. Surgical teams are another great example. In fact, teamwork in general is something that uh, I've studied and many, many of my colleagues in our, in our uh, discipline study. And it's another example that's commonly used for collaboration, particularly the buzzword type collaboration. Here we have a surgical team. There they are in action, hopefully not killing someone. And do you notice that in that team, and in this picture it's very interesting, do you notice that everybody's dressed with different kinds of clothes? That signals different roles. It also signals different statuses. And one of the interesting paradoxes of collaboration, of course, is how people with differential power and status can end up working together. It's one of the roots of one of the paradoxes we'll talk about later. Another interesting collaboration, now we're back to a dyad, is Matisse and Picasso, two savage artistic rivals at the turn of the century. Each pretended to hate the other, each competed with each other. Picasso once bought one of Matisse's paintings and trashed it and yet they were collaborators. A very interesting exhibit showed parallels of different paintings that they did. And sometimes Picasso did one first, sometimes Matisse did one first. But they basically worked together reacting to each other. And you can see some of the similarities in this particular pair of paintings. Matisse moved first, I believe, in this one. And Picasso watched him carefully. Towards the end of their lives, they each talked about the other. And I'll let you read these quotes, but I want to highlight one or two things. Picasso says, no one has ever looked at Matisse's painting more carefully than I, and no one has looked at mine more carefully than he. Matisse said, when one of us dies, there'll be some things that the other will never be able to talk of with anyone else. This is an interesting case because it's a competitive collaboration. These people push themselves, these guys push themselves to higher and higher goals by competing collaboratively. Fold It, which I talked about in the last session just before this one, is another interesting example of collaboration. Uh, the analysis of proteins is a very difficult thing, and how proteins function depends on how they're folded. Well, molecular biologists spend hours figuring out how to fold these things. And they have literally millions of proteins they have to figure out the structure of. An almost endless, thankless, impossible task. It can't be computerized very well, by the way. Somebody had an interesting idea, so they set up a website in which people compete to see who can fold the protein the best. They've got amateur scientists who come onto the website, learn the science of protein folding, and the folds they're allowed to make are only those that are allowed by the science. And 75,000 players, often in teams, generally in teams, uh, work to fold the proteins. Um, interestingly, the amateurs do as good or better a job than the professional biologists do. And they generally, in fact, almost always have beat the computer programs that study folding. A very interesting case of collaboration because a lot of these people will never see each other, maybe never meet, but it's a collaboration, I would argue. The final collaboration I'll talk about here today is one near home. It's called MABUS, the Mutual Aid Alarm Box System, and uh, John Lammers and a number of us at Illinois are studying this one. This is a, a, an organization in Illinois in which 
fire departments cooperate to aid each other when a fire gets too big for a local district to handle. So if the district gets, if the fire gets too big, I can pull in two or three engines from a nearby community and it's set up so that it, they don't give so much of their resources that they endanger their community. There's a compact to provide response and it's a very interesting example. It's actually a national model and it it astoundingly has improved emergency response in Illinois. Now, the interesting thing about this one is these are hierarchical organizations. They're like military organizations, and yet they're collaborating on an even ground. In fact, one of them said a lot of fire chiefs didn't want to do this because they didn't want to lose control, but then they suddenly realized that collaborating gave them more control. So they entered into this. And another interesting thing about Mabus is, is Mabus is really an example of a institutional groundwork for control. And that's another thing that is one of the things that will address some of the paradoxes I'm going to get to in just a few minutes. Now, what are the characteristics of a good collaboration? There's been a lot of writing on this, including some that I've done over the years, but generally we can boil down five characteristics. One is the collaboration is active. Collaboration is about doing something, accomplishing a goal, working together. The words teamwork come to mind, but other words come to mind as well. It's also social and relational. It involves direct interaction among the people, often very intensive interaction. They develop relationships among themselves. It's also confrontative. As our example of Matisse and Picasso showed, and as the fire chief example showed, very often collaborations are not real nice. People argue, they fight with each other, but they're always pushing each other towards the common activity, towards the common goal, and that's what makes the collaboration work. Collaborations are also, Lori Lewis argues, empowering. That is, that they really give power to people because the collective is more than the individual, but they're also empowering because each person is actively enabled to participate in the, cl in the collaboration. And finally, they're emergent. One of the things about collaboration is it can yield unexpected results. We know what we have when we go into a collaboration. We don't always know what we're going to come out of it with. And that is one of the, ma one of the magic things about collaboration, and I think is one reason so many people in our field are interested in it. Now, collaboration is something that occurs over time. And I like to think of collaborations as woven rather than created. And this would be a picture of a collaboration occurring over time in an imaginary world between five people. One of them, I guess, isn't very happy at the beginning of it, the top little circle. But the others are all happy. Over time, they work together in different patterns. You notice that sometimes they're off on their own thinking. Sometimes they're all working together and focused in common. Sometimes they're in subgroups. I think that's a really important thing. You know, when we study groups and we study collaboration, we tend to figure they're always all together. And in this world in which we have virtual groups, but even in the previous world where we didn't, that's not the case. And my argument would be that, in fact, it's often these periods where people are alone that the really important work gets done. Because that's when somebody has a great idea, that's when somebody has a killer insight that they bring back and maybe combine with somebody else's idea to create something that they couldn't have imagined before. This temporal process is essential, I think, to understand collaboration, but it's also important to understand why the paradoxes emerge that we'll be talking about in a moment. Temporal elements of collaboration imply a couple of things. First of all, there's often collaborative events. You know, if we go back here, you can see there are times that we would clearly say these people are collaborating. Are they collaborating when they're thinking on their own? I'd say they are, maybe, but others might disagree. But there's a temporal aspect of this, and so often we mistake the moments of collaboration for where the real value is being added. And I think that that's an important thing to bear in mind. It's also important to realize that collaborations can have very different lengths. And I'll address that in just a second, the image that they have the different lengths. One, uh, uh, some collaborations are quite temporary. You know, for example, the surgical team may meet one time for a surgery, and the same set of people may never be together again after that surgery is over. 
Mabus has been in existence for 15 or 20 years and looks to be in existence for a lot more. So they're very different time frames. And one of the things that we haven't really addressed in our field is differences in how collaboration works when we have these different time frames and different expectations for the future. The other thing, and this is a little bit maybe more sinister, is post hoc processes. Since collaborations are temporal, they end. And after the fact, and during in fact, we weave stories as we weave the collaborations, and the stories tell about it. I'm a member of a wonderful collaboration called the Virtual Worlds Exploratorium that's studying game worlds with three other universities, wonderful colleagues, and we're always telling each other stories about it. But one interesting thing about these stories, and it's one of the things in our culture, and it does root one of the paradoxes, is that part of these stories is allocating credit. And in my opinion, too often, we look to one person as the source of something, when it's really a collective. And in fact, I'd say about 95% of the time it's a collective. And we give the credit to an individual. It's an interesting uh, shuffle for credit that often goes on in collaborations. Now I want to distinguish two kinds of collaboration, and this is by way of sorting out a few of the ideas I brought up earlier. Collaboration one and collaboration two. Collaboration one is coordination. Collaboration two adds to collaboration one. It, it requires it, but it builds on it. And it adds that additional creative spark that we look for. Collaboration one is sufficient for everyday collaboration. You know, in some ways, I hesitate to call it collaboration one because that implies that it's inferior. It certainly is not. It's extremely valuable. That's why group, books like Steve's are so valuable because they tell us how to get groups of people to work together. To collaborate on collaboration one, people have to be prepared. They have to have programs. They have to have roles and know other people's roles and be able to adapt. And you know collaboration one is going well when people are satisfied, when there's a feeling of smoothness and problem solving going on. Now collaboration two builds on the foundation of collaboration to that, that sort of creativity, the little spark that we always associate with collaboration. Synergy, surprise, the unexpected if you will. This is the kind of collaboration that changes people's lives. I've talked to many people who look back and say, I remember working with so-and-so and it was a transformative experience. And I think when we get up to collaboration two, we're entering that realm of transformative experience. It requires flexibility, ambiguity, and creative improvisation. And you know it's going well when you're surprised and maybe delighted by what's going on, perhaps appalled. But also, I think delight is generally the, the, um, the emotion we associate with it. What determines exactly whether we can achieve collaboration at all, collaboration one or collaboration two? I've done a lot of thinking about this over the years, and there are a lot of formulas, but I think the formulas tend to be overly simplistic. And I would ground the, the notion that we achieve collaboration depending on how we handle paradoxes that, come, that are inherent within it. Paradox has been a central concern of our communication discipline from the sophists to the present day. And I list but a few of the scholars that I've drawn on and learned from about this topic. In common parlance, of course, a paradox is a thought-provoking contrast, something that's kind of a little problematic to us. When we study rhetoric, it's a trope. When we go to logic, it's a case in which you're driven to two contrary and contradictory conclusions by apparently sound reasoning. We have many paradoxes that we try to deal with. These are all extremely thought-provoking and they've led people to think about paradox because they're intriguing. But when we study paradoxes as they occur in the real world rather than the world of language or the world of logic, we're dealing with social paradoxes, and in my opinion, those are a little bit different. They're based in dualities, just like paradoxes are. You know, the duality between individuality and collectivity, for example, is one that I'll be mentioning. But they also are a little bit rougher than logical paradoxes. I'm sweeping in under this term tensions and contradictions that could potentially develop into, uh, into oppositions. 
They play out in the world, not only in language. So we have to think about how they get resolved by taking time and space into account. And you'll see how we can do that and how several scholars have done that in a moment. They have personal and emotional impacts. It's not just up here, it's down here that we feel paradoxes often. And that's where they often cause the problems for us. And they almost always involve some kind of reflexivity or tension. For example, Bakhtin's notion of paradox, a very common one developed in our field, or tensions, is that if you have two poles, the closer you get to one, the stronger the other draws you back. So you're inevitably cycling back and forth. This can become very layered, and it can lead to things like double binds if we get stuck in a paradox at some level. But we don't have to get stuck because how, uh, how we deal with paradoxes really determines their impact. I think that underlying collaboration, there are three basic paradoxes. First of all, the paradox between control and indeterminacy. We have to bring actions to paradox. We have to take actions. We have to try to take control of the situation. We make a suggestion. We advance an idea. But at the same time, we don't want that control to be so strong that it takes all the indeterminacy out. Because by not determining what the outcome is going to be and letting it emerge, we profit from collaboration. But by creating all of that indeterminacy, we also create a feeling of, con of, uh, of uncertainty that's often uncomfortable, and we try to control. And the more urgency there is and the more time pressure, the more we try to do it. Both of those poles implicate each other, and they both feed back on each other. Second is the paradox of, of immediacy versus a distal view. Collaboration is a very here and now kind of thing. You have to really focus, and almost many people report, especially in creative collaborations, the collaboration two type, losing track of time, just focusing in and just losing all sense of where they are and what they're doing. But at the same time, for the collaboration to have meaning, it has to have a connection with the past and it has to project something valuable for the future. And so we're always cycling back between the senses Immediacy is informed by purpose, which is grounded in the past and in the future. But if you look at the past and future too much, you lose your creativity and focus. You lose your sense, your grasp on the immediate moment, and thereby lose part of the paradox. Once again, you can't have either without the other. They mutually implicate each other, but they also present something of a dilemma for us. The final paradox is the master one for me, and it's one I've struggled against a lot in my career, and that's individualism versus collectivity. For a collaboration to really work, you need real folks with real talent in the right place at the right time, and they need to be assertive. They need to bring their individuality. But for me, the beauty of collaboration is the very loss of that the sense that you become part of a collective that's moving forward and there's no ownership and you're just focused on the problem and you're just trying so hard to solve it or trying so hard to make that breakthrough that you lose all sense of yourself. But at the same time, since collaboration is temporal and we're all egotistical little animals, we want credit later on. We also want control. And as you can see, these all interweave with each other. And so there's inherent in every paradox is a, a, a portion of individualism, a portion of complexity that are in a real sense struggling with each other. And as I mentioned, I don't really think that these paradoxes are insurmountable. In fact, it's how we handle them that determines what level of collaboration we achieve. These paradoxes present opportunities as much as they present problems. Some of the dangers of not really taking paradoxes into account and collapsing on one end are listed here. And this is just a few, but these are some of the things I've tried to fight against during my whole career as a group and organizational communication scholar. One person pretends to be collaborating and manipulates everybody else to get their idea on. I've heard plenty of people say that. Suckered them in, pretended to be cooperative, and they bet. 
Expropriation of common products, which I've already mentioned. The collective creates something, but we don't acknowledge that. We take it as an individual to ourselves. And the uninspired pseudo-collaboration that Cynthia Stoll and George Cheney so well described years ago, where people order their subordinates to collaborate in quality circles, and they all pretend to collaborate, and nobody believes in it, and nothing comes out of it that's any good. All of which, all of these three, combine to create a loss of faith in collaboration, which I think is just the saddest thing in the world. But I've seen more than enough people that just say, don't have time for this, it's not going to work anyway, so we're going to shortcut it. They lose so many opportunities for creativity by doing this. And they do so, I think, partly because they have a poverty of options in terms of dealing with paradoxes. We don't in our field. Thanks to Baxter and Montgomery, to Linda Putnam and her colleagues, and to some small degree, some contributions that I and John Lammers and people at Illinois that are working with us have made in recent years, we have a number of different options. The first two options for handling paradox are uh, stick your head in the sand, deny it. But the second one is go to one side of the paradox and just hope you pick the right one for the moment. Two others involve switching. One of them is switching over time, honoring one pole of the paradox, for example, collectivity for a while, and then switching to consider the other, individualism. Another option is to segment by space, and that is to assign one set of people to deal with one pole of the paradox and another set to deal with the other pole of the paradox. This, for example, in a company. Companies often send out calls for new ideas. IBM does this all the time. Give us your new ideas, brainstorm, send them to us. Then we give them to a committee of managers who collectively decide which ideas are the good ones. So we have individualism in one part of the organization, collectivity in the other part. Two more responses. Well, one more response we found and added to this is the cosmetic response, where people wave their hands about paradox and do nothing. And of course, the academic's favorite, transcendence. We look at the paradox, we appreciate both sides, we be creative, we find some way to deal with it, and all is wonderful with the world. This is normatively, of course, the one that appeals to me, but one of the things that we found in our research is that it's a pretty expensive option, and many times choosing one of the lesser ones can do, be good enough, as they say, for government work, but uh, also deal with your paradox. Now, a couple of more constraints here. Not all paradoxes are created equal. Sometimes the poles are... When you have a big problem that involves a lot of people and a lot of urgency, the paradoxical pole is stronger, I believe. The, also, as I mentioned, the responses differ in terms of time and effort, and we can change responses over time. Now, what I would now want to turn to is having kind of talked about this, is to talk a little bit about how some of the scholars in our field have provided the resources for dealing with these paradoxes of collaboration. They haven't completely solved all the problems, but we've made a lot of progress. And to tell you the truth, as I've said, I think a lot of other fields could learn a lot from us. I'm going to talk about a general solution that's been suggested. Then I'm going to talk about how we can address paradox through micro-level interaction, through procedures and technology, and through building institutions. In general, and this is very abstract, but this is based upon my reading of uh, work in interpersonal organizational communication in my own research, non-collaborative processes are most likely if you choose responses at the low end of that scale that I gave you. If you deny it, you paper it over, or you do too rigid a selection, like favoring only the individual or slavishly going with the collective. Collaboration one is more likely if you do a flexible selection. Maybe we're going to emphasize the group more, but we're going to make sure that we try sometimes to have individual input. It also is very likely in the case of segmentation, as the example I gave indicates, you know, of the individuals brainstorming ideas and the committee deciding on them. And alternation is another one. Alternation done in a heavy-handed way with someone directing the group is not very likely to, is very likely to lead to good coordination, but it's not as likely to lead to collaboration too. I believe collaboration, too, is most likely, of course, in the case of transcendence. But I also think clever alternation driven by the needs of the group can do it as well.
And I hope some of the examples I'll be talking about in just a few moments illustrate that. First, let's go to the micro level. We have an incredibly rich tradition of research on dialogue in our field. Barnett Pierce, years ago, was one of the leaders in this, and Ken Cisna, but I list a number of people here, many of my colleagues in group communication, who've sincerely worked on this. And dialogue, since if you do dialogue right, it aims to try to promote discourse that is transcendent. It promotes generative thinking. It brings diversity in. I believe in many ways, if we can manage dialogue correctly, it really squares the circle in a way. It lets us transcend many of those paradoxes or tensions that I mentioned earlier. I think also integrative conflict management, as mentioned by communication scholars, a bit more heavy handed, not quite as evanescent, not quite as in the moment as the dialogic approaches. But I think it has incredible incredible potential as well. The main challenges here, of course, is that individuation often rears its head in any dialogue, because dialogue, as dialogic researchers know, often becomes monologue, and people square off against each other. The other danger here, of course, is control. The need to hurry, which unfortunately we sometimes have, can militate against this. The need to somehow take control can prevent sincerely addressing the paradoxes. But in my opinion, the dialogic research I read has the best potential to really lead to transcendent outcomes. Now, a thing I've done a lot over my career, and a lot of group communication scholars do, is teach people procedures. Reflective thinking, brainstorming, etc. And there is a lot of evidence, believe it or not, I've done reviews of this, there's a lot of evidence that they really help, even though they're boring and a problem, you know, people resist procedures because they don't like them, they're unnatural, but there's a lot of evidence that they work if they're wide adapted to the situation and, as Larry Browning has pointed out, if they're followed in the spirit and not rigidly. Here's an example of a collaboration procedure, which you probably can't read, but this is after David Strauss's method of collaboration. And what it does is it specifies over time a series of different kinds of meetings that will be held between stakeholders. And of course, ideally, you'd want to hold them in a dialogic fashion, uh, if you could. Procedures work for a number of reasons listed here that I won't go through. But what they generally do in terms of the options that they pose for us is, is they, they're best suited for the alternation and segmentation strategies. That is, procedures tend to say, do this at time one, this at time two. So you can address different portions of the paradox at different times or in different groups. The procedure for generating and choosing ideas I mentioned is a very common one. Procedures are less likely to result in collaboration, too, in my opinion, than uh, the dialogic approach. Um, and its main challenge, of course, is rigidity on the part of the person using the procedures. Well, we also have a lot of research in our field and in other fields on technology and how it can promote collaboration. And I've taught a course in collaboration technology. I taught it for a number of years. Typically, this is how people are asked to collaborate, or Facebook, or other things like that. They're great for communication until a problem occurs, until some kind of fight breaks out, or some kind of problem that's hard to solve, and then they break down. Technology is really only a good answer for these problems like formal decision models or computer-aided assistance to the decision-making. The problem is, as I, as I pointed out a while ago, these systems have never been widely accepted, nor are they widely circulated on the web because they take knowledge to operate. Someday we'll maybe automate them, and then they'll be wide, more widely used. But they don't have that much promise. There are also large-scale collaborative projects, and I've already mentioned Foldit, uh, from projects like the Virtual Astronomy Observatory, Wikipedia. I noticed that in Spectra, we have a, one, a, a whole actual issue of Spectra that stresses collaboration and interdisciplinary work. And Wikipedia is one of the examples that's been used in that. In this technology, there are some keys to how you design it. You need to design an information commons that gives people the information they need to participate. So in Folded, you have some science, 
directed to the layperson. You have instructions on how to participate in the community. You have a scoreboard for which team is folded at the best, and you can kind of monitor yourself. You have all sorts of interesting tools that direct people's attention. A modular structure also helps. The bigger the collaboration, the better it is if things can be broken down. And what this enables is expertise to be matched in a kind of design serendipity. And what you have in these, in these environments is not collaboration through the whole environment, but little bitty, little bitty collaborations and little bitty collaboration ones and little bitty collaboration twos. But if that, but the system, a well-designed system will surface those, bring them to the attention of other people, like Foldit does, and, um, and basically educate the whole group about how to collaborate better. Um, and there are some other things like signaling me mechanisms and transparencies of progress. I think in this case what we see in these large-scale environments is a real mix of collaboration, but that they can in fact be designed to stimulate creativity in a pretty amazing ways. Now the final thing I'm going to touch on is we've had some excellent work in our field on building institutional groundworks for collaboration. One piece of work that I particularly like is done by John Gastel and his colleagues, Burkhalter, Gastel, and Kelshaw, built a beautiful model of how public deliberation can become a self-reinforcing process, whereby through participating in deliberation and getting the outcomes that you probably can't read here, people actually build their collaborative potential build their ability, build their faith and able to do it in a kind of self-reinforcing cycle. And this is just a wonderful model that I think is, a, and they've, they've empirically validated parts of it, and that is a very impressive uh, uh, contribution, I think, of our field. Our field also, through the growing, in, uh, growing emphasis on institutional communication, can help us understand how institutions are built. In Mabus, and I won't go through all the points here because they, it, the uh, time is getting on, but in Mabus they do a lot of institutional communication where they communicate to the outside world why Mabus is important, they communicate to the fire chiefs why it's important, they do training, they do things that get people interacting, knowing each other, building a collaboration collaborative community. None of this really creates collaboration one or collaboration two, frankly, but it lays the groundwork for it. And it draws our attention to something that I think is important. And that is that collaboration is not just rooted in the interactions of people. It's rooted in the context and the institutions that surround them. And we need to contribute more in building them as our colleagues here have done. I'll conclude here with a few questions. Um, one question, obviously, is how can we best meet these paradoxes? I think rather than trying to lay out simple formulas for collaboration, we ought to follow the way that Bob Craig and Karen Tracy have advised in practical theory and look at dilemmas and paradoxes and how we're going to address them. And importantly, I think we need to look at the relationships among the levels I've just touched on. We need to understand improvisation more. We also need to theorize differences among kinds of collaborations. People tend to address it like it's all the same thing. And while there's a lot of commonalities, there's a lot of differences too, depending on the context that you're in. How can procedures, and could we devise better procedures that could actually encourage collaboration too? I've tried to build systems that encourage those things. Every one of them has failed, but I continue to believe that if we build our knowledge base, we'll figure out ways to do this. And finally, how do we build collaborative contexts and institutions? Perhaps a bigger question is, how do we do this in a savagely competitive world? You watch television and you wouldn't think that there's much collaboration going on. All the credit's given to individuals. It's a war of all against all. Things are just not, they, don't, they aren't set up to encourage people to value collaboration. How do we develop the capacity to build islands of collaboration like you build islands of resistance? And how do you get these islands to spread? And finally, what's the best way to teach collaboration? I think we, many of us know this in our hearts, and it comes probably less in words than in deeds and examples, but this is a very important topic. And finally, 
can we develop an ethics of communication and collaboration? I think this is something that our field is well on its way to doing. But it would be great to see a lot more explicit discussion of this in the literature on the ethics and in the philosophy of communication literature. I'll close with a quote from James Watson, one of the people that decoded DNA and actually got a lot of personal credit standing on the back of other people's work. But he was, later in his life, truly realized how much he did this. And he thanked people that he worked with and said this. I'll also close, though, with a final quote, and that is to raise another question. And it's a question I really think we do need to really step back, even after 30 years of studying it, step back and think of is, what is collaboration? In preparing this, I've seen facets of it I didn't imagine existed. I've seen questions I wouldn't have ever asked. I think it's incredibly important to ask a question and to keep in mind what Moishe the Beatle said, that every question possesses a power that in some ways is lost in the answer. And so even after we advance answers, it's so important to return to those questions over and over again. It's been a great honor to deliver this lecture, and I really appreciate your attention, especially since I was rather long, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. You're free. Go. Go.